All right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Navigating Customer Service Through a Pandemic. Uh, just some info on library information and how Zoom works this evening. The library is now open and we're back to our regular hours. We ask that you wear your snugly fit cloth or disposable mask and practice safe social distancing while you visit us. We are available electronically. Let me go to the right slide. And we're happy to answer any questions you may have, and you can reach out to us through chat at champagne.org or over email at librarian at champagne.org. You can also call us at 217-403-2070 and we'll answer during our open hours. We are doing book a librarian appointments in person for 15 minutes or virtually for an hour. To request a session, visit www.champagne.org slash book a librarian to fill out a request form. They, these are one-on-one -on -one appointments with me, Madeline Wolski, where we can discuss all aspects of entrepreneurship and business and I can connect you with the resources within our library and community. We are recording today's webinar and we'll be placing this online to our YouTube channel. Lastly, I'd like to briefly go over some of the Zoom features available to you. Starting at the bottom left hand side of your screen, you can adjust your audio settings like changing your speaker. Moving to the center bottom of your screen, you'll see a chat and raise hand option. Clicking on the chat will open or close a chat box on the right side of your Zoom window. We invite you to type in chat as needed. It's a great tool to ask questions, leave comments for the presenter or library staff. If you ask a question in the chat, our host, myself, will relay it to the presenter and it will be shared with all participants. We also want to encourage you to share your own experiences as a business owner or someone who's involved in customer service. So today is going to be a little bit more of a relaxed webinar. If you would like to speak, uh, you can raise your hand and I will gladly unmute you so you can be involved in the conversation. Please also let us know if you have any technical difficulties um, and I can help troubleshoot you uh, over chat. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Jennifer Russell is a University of Illinois Extension educator in community and economic development, as she serves communities in West Central Illinois. She's a graduate of the University of Illinois and holds a master's degree in public administration from Southern Illinois University at Edwardsville. Uh, Jennifer has worked with businesses, nonprofits, and government for over 20 years, and we are so pleased to have her this evening joining us. Jennifer, I will let you take over the screen. Sounds great. And we are looking forward to the webinar. Okay. Did I hit share by any chance? You did. It looks great. You just need to present the yep. PowerPoint. Sounds great. I thought I would have went too far. Okay, perfect. Okay. Well, I'm going to be working off of two computers, so I'll hopefully still look into the screen here and stay connected with you guys in the audience. And Madeline, thank you so much for your introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to present this program, and thank you to those that are hearing it live tonight or checking out this uh, webinar at a future date. Really appreciate the opportunity. So tonight I want to start off just, you know, I work in downstate Illinois and I've been down here for 20 plus years with the University of Illinois Extension Office. And I am really passionate about customer service and I knew during this pandemic it was going to be really important that we spend some time on customer service. So I'll go ahead and get started with our slideshow. Okay, so tonight's focus is going to be on you know what customers want, what they're looking for, what they're hoping uh, they'll find when they get out into the community, what managers and owners can do, and I hope that we at the end can talk together and share some best practices. This is an extremely difficult time across the world and we know that business owners are under pressure to keep their businesses going and that the staff members are also stressed and worried about their jobs and we know before the pandemic that good customer service just doesn't happen. It really has to be something that we plan, that we teach, um, that we implement. And so tonight, you know, let's dialogue together and, you know, kind of take a look at what strategies and things we can do to make a real impact in customer service during this time. Okay. 
you know, from this picture, you can kind of see a couple places that, you know, look like, you know, this is a worldwide pandemic. And I want to start off by just saying, you know, this pandemic is affecting everyone worldwide. But I know when Madeline and I were speaking earlier before the call, one thing I said to her is it's affecting everyone and everyone is involved in looking for the solutions from business to government to medical. And so that gives me hope um, for the future and really is encouraging. And I hope tonight we can kind of utilize um, the platform of working with others on this call and then hopefully other people that see this will reach out uh, to other you know businesses competitors and kind of come together to try to get the best in information and advice one of the things i'll point out uh, at the beginning is that so many people are willing to help during this time uh, business owners that have done you know very well and maybe at the end of their careers but are able to reach out and help and I know nationally we've seen some of those I quote one in, in this talk tonight it was Mark Cuban who some people have seen on Shark Tank or know him because of basketball but he has been giving advice he had 6,000 business owners reach out to him directly and he answered their questions and I think that's really really interesting and I'll just share a little bit about what he said he said experiment with new ideas if you can find other services to offer that you, you know, do it. Um, since you have holes in your schedule, it's a great time to, to brainstorm, to think about other things, to kind of look at some other areas that, you know, you're just not sure if it's going to stick or not and try it. Again, he said, brainstorm with those competitors of yours. Really get to know your employees so you know if you have to make changes, you'll know, you know, what impacts that'll have on, their on your employees. And then his last bit of advice was clean up the parts of your business. There's always something to clean up um, that maybe you've neglected in the past that you could work on during this time. And I think, you know, I've seen that um, just in business storefronts and seeing a real revitalization in some areas around me where people have had time to maybe send, spend some time on the exterior of their buildings um, when they've been shut down or do some work on the inside um, when they've had to do curbside and delivery. So I think we'll take some of those uh, comments and realize that there's so many people out there that are willing to offer suggestions and help. We just need to reach out to them and find them on our social media networks or other or their other avenues, especially even through the library. Okay. Absolutely. I have a quick question. You bet. Um, what are ways that you recommend connecting with competitors? Well, or how I, do you reach out your competitors? You know, I think you could, you know, work through your chamber of commerce. Number one is probably a great way to do it. Let's let's put something together. A lot of people, if they're involved with their chamber, know that there's like a chamber business group. And you know, I think it would be a simple thing to kind of even ask your chamber. Let's put together a call with you know comp you know competitors. Let's let's do something casual. Let's do it on Zoom potentially and have a conversation with them, reach out to them. I think even a simple phone call uh, to people right now, I think people would be willing to just, you know, have them, you know, reach out directly. And let's say, let's have a conversation about, about what we're doing and what might work. I mean, we don't have to give away all of our trade secrets, but I think to kind of have that dialogue would be really important. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but are you thinking of anything else that might be beneficial? No, I think that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, one of the other things I wanted to do, though, before we get going too far into the discussion for tonight is realize, let me just change slides here real quick, you know, customers, you know, customer service really, you know, some things haven't changed, you know, what customers want now um, really hasn't changed since before the pandemic, you know, customers are looking for someone who's ultimately interested in helping them, and that, you know, might look, you know, externally by someone who's friendly efficient and pleasant. It might be someone who really demonstrates competence or that commitment to go the extra mile. And in all of those things, it kind of shows you engagement, that that person is truly engaged. One thing I think business owners need to think about, though, um, there's a study that I cite in, in this program tonight that has found, you know, there's about three psychological conditions that influence engagement. And one of those is meaningfulness. You know, how meaningful is the work that I'm doing? The second one though is safety, which says, you know, as an employee, do I feel safe working here? Prior to the pandemic, that was about, you know, do I feel safe around my colleagues? Do I feel safe reaching out in a group activities? Uh, but now it you know, kind of takes on a new meaning. Do I feel safe being here in this office? You know, do I feel safe with the procedures that we do when the customers aren't coming in the door? 
And the third one is availability. And that kind of references, you know, the personal resources that the employee has to fulfill their role um, free from distraction and preoccupation. And I think that's a hard one right now, that at least two of the three of those things are really difficult during this pandemic. And we really need to take some time with our staff and really kind of work with them and, and look at these three areas and see as business owners, can we do any more to make sure that these three areas are covered? Okay, I'm going to move on to the next slide. One thing that hasn't changed also um, during the pandemic is customers are still forming their opinions in the first seven seconds. You know, the opinion starts, you know, so quickly in the interaction between you and your customers. And I would say, you know, for those of you that were able to open for a time, or I know we're kind of pulled back again, but those interactions could be as simple as someone driving by and, and seeing no cars, seeing lots of cars, seeing people standing out and maybe too close for their own, you know, maybe not doing social distancing. You know, it all kind of starts very quickly in, in the relationship um, of, and a lot of it is nonverbal. So 93% of the way customers are judging you is still not on the words you're saying, but body language, appearance, personal care, the attitude, all of that outside of the words you're speaking. So again, don't forget that as we move towards looking at, you know, how to improve customer service during this pandemic. Any questions? Okay. We don't have any right now. <laughs> okay. Sounds great. Okay. Let me move on. Well, so what's different um, because of this pandemic? There's a company out there that does a lot of survey work and they're called McKinsey and McKinsey is surveying people all over the world and they're putting out a lot of great surveys. Um, it almost seems like on a monthly basis we're getting new ones from in the US, outside of the US and around the world. One thing, you know, what they're saying as of this August 7th, 2020 survey, that there is a renewed sentiment for the health, safety and care of the customer. And the other piece that is staggering as well is that 73% of customers have not fully re-engaged with out-of-home activities. And so we, we know that there's, you know, there's more things that we could be doing because people have really stayed away because of this, but we realize how impacted, you know, the safety, health, and care of the customer is at this time. Okay. So what are those customers looking for as they're looking at health, safety, and care? And I think it's things, Madeline, you mentioned early on in the call, even when you were talking, you know, kind of your intro to today's program, even about coming to the library. Customers are looking for, you know, if you look at the pictures on the screen here, you know, did we create the distance, you know, in seating? Did we create, you know, kind of this handsless uh, way to pay or interact at the table, you know, when we're signing out, you know, are you handing me a pen that I'm not sure has been cleaned or not? Uh, if I, if it's maybe a, an office where temperatures have to be taken and masks are on, are they on appropriately? You know, all of those things really mean a lot right now to what the customer is looking for. Absolutely. I yeah. completely agree. We actually had one of our, um, a regular patron who had mentioned she'd come into the Champaign Public Library and she was like, because I see everyone wearing their mask, because you are patiently reminding people to make sure it's over their nose and they're wearing it properly, she's like, I feel safer here than I do at the grocery store. And it's, it's incredible how these small things just really elevate the customer's experience. It, it really does. So, the, you know, the first thing they'll see, you know, particularly in some restaurants might be just the seating layouts outside. They might look in the windows and see those seating layouts inside. Do they seem different? Has that changed? Are they seeing partitions up? Are they seeing your cleaning protocols listed, um, whether it be on your website? whether it be on a signage around your business somewhere, if there's a bathroom that's accessible, are the cleaning protocols stressed in there as well? So I think all of those things really do play a role. I think the biggest thing for me is you feel like you're doing everything right um, in the customer experience. And then at the end, you hand them a pen that you had your hands on. And I think for the customer, they, they take it because they don't want to be impolite, but they're sitting there thinking, gosh, I wish, you know, I would have even get, been given time to dig one out of my own pocket or that there was something on the counter that said clean pens and then, you know, dirty pens. 
And so you have a place where you could go, okay, you know, can I, I just don't want to touch anything. And so I think those kind of things you really just need to pay attention to because it just, you know, that's what's impacting the customer experience right now. Before the pandemic, we were all about this customer experience. That's what they were going shopping for is, you know, how does it feel? How do they enjoy themselves? And now that experience is so, you know, impacted by this virus that those are the things now that, that people who are going out are looking for. Uh, let's see, my last point, looking for staff to reach out. So one of the things that I'm not seeing and that I think customers, and I hope some of you on the call would agree, that you're looking for, for certain companies that you always utilize before the pandemic to reach out to you if you haven't frequented their store during this time. So for example, um, you know, I, you know, used to always get a massage and I know I still have a massage, you know, uh, available that I've already paid for, but I haven't heard from the company and I, I don't want to go during this time just for my own personal safety, but if they were selling something else like, you know, foot cream or some kind of facial cream, if they started doing, you know, a line of products that they've researched for facials and I would buy that, you know, just to support them. If I was contacted by, you know, I always went to this really great pizza restaurant and the gentleman was from Peru and he used to make some Peruvian dishes. If he was giving a tour of Peru with a video show of his family and, and things happening in Peru for a night out from home, I would support him. So, you know, all of those kinds of things I think are what customers are looking for. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit later in the the conference or in this talk tonight, um, just, you know, some really innovative ways that people are you know, revolutionizing what the experience will be like in their stores. So we'll get to that in just a second. Okay, one thing customers are also looking for, I've, I see this name everywhere, um, everywhere I'm reading, it's called BOPIS. I don't know if you guys have seen it that are on the call, but, and I'm not even sure if it's BOPIS or BOPIS, but it's buy online, pick up in store. And it's kind of all the, you know, it's what's happening right now in so many different places. It's where people, if they're not shopping solely online, this is what they're doing. And so customers are, sh are willing to be uh, inconvenienced um, for their safety. So if you say, oh, I've got to clean that off before you can do this, they're willing to wait. The one area I would say would, would be no is if they're buying online and they're just wanting to come in, grab and go, and they're being asked to wait. I think that's a problem that you'd really have to work on because I think when that happens, a lot of customers are like, why didn't I just buy it online? I, I really didn't want to be in here any longer than I had to. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, customers are also looking to get a lot done on your website. So they want to shop and browse, order, pay. They want to know about curbside delivery. They want to know um, notification, when's my order ready? Uh, they want all of this done um, as hands-free as possible. And they also want to know that you're doing, you know, they would like to read about your staff training protocols. So if those are on your website, I think it would be very helpful for the customer as well. Um, so kind of just to give you a little bit of information about what's happening with online shopping, just so that you have an idea to gauge 2019 to 2020. And so the, I think I've got a research point in the list here from MainStreet.org, and they um, have a study that showed um, e-commerce sales in the United States were up 11% in 2019 for retail. And in 2020, um, consumers are expected to spend $709 billion on e-commerce this year, which is a figure that represents an 18% increase. So you know e-commerce is really what's you know, driving kind of the change because we're also seeing um, a 14% bricks and mortar spending decrease. And so it's, it's really important um, as you are looking at strategies that you really examine your online space or if you can do this buy online, pick up in store, or if you can do it old school, call your customer, place an order for them that don't have the ability or the desire to do it and have it ready um, for delivery or pick up quickly by just grab and go. So those are some of the areas. Any questions on any of that or any comments about your experiences or what's, what's been happening in, your, um, in the stores you, you normally shop in? My husband and I were big fans of uh, Bopis. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Which that's, yep. that's how I've decided to pronounce it. Okay, that's what I was calling it but, before, yeah. but I wasn't sure. I wasn't <laughs> I sure. It's more just fun for me to say it that way. Yeah. 
especially for restaurants, I think that's at least our favorites, that's what's the most popular. But it is intimidating at times to go in. And um, now that we're back in phase three, it's not really an issue anymore. But um, when we were in phase four, people would be eating in the restaurant while you had to walk in and grab the item. Um, And it would have been good to know that the op there was, I'm not sure if there even was an option to just kind of pick up. But I really like what you had mentioned about the web page content. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize how, yeah, if I were able to read exactly what this restaurant was doing, mm-hmm. I would absolutely probably increase the amount of times I, were, I was partaking in that. Specific. Well, and one of the points I think I make on a future slide, and just because you've brought it up, I'll answer it now. One of the things they were saying is it's great to say, you know, you're following the governmental guidelines, but they're saying it's even more important that you have so much care and concern of your customers that you've gone above and beyond what that is. And so you don't just kind of say, hey, I'm doing the guidelines, but you really spell it out. And so that's, that's really important because I know, you know, for example, um, I had to find a new dentist and this particular dentist, you know, I was kind of going and researching. I didn't see a lot online, but luckily, um, as I was kind of trying to kind of finalize going to the dentist, the frontline staff who answered the call said, we've recently installed two new filtration systems for the air quality here and kind of walked me through um, an entire kind of you know, process that they're following, which really kind of eased my concerns as a customer. If I had read that on their website, I would have been thrilled to kind of know that as well um, ahead of time. And it might have kept, you know, luckily that frontline staff said it, um, but I think people need to express it even more so than they do. Absolutely. Um, We do have one question. Sure. So you had mentioned the 14% decrease in brick and mortar spending. Was that pre-COVID estimates or? Let me go back real quick. Hold on just a second. Okay, so the 14% decrease, Mm -hmm. okay, so it says um, the figure, okay, 18% increase in e-commerce this year, 14.5% increase in overall retail spending, but bricks and mortar retail spending is expected to decrease 14% this year during COVID. During COVID, okay. I wasn't sure if that was an estimation, because I would think it would be higher. Um. Well, we'll see, because this was, um, this came in probably in August. So, you know, you know, I'm not sure anybody knew how long that this would last. So at the time they were seeing, you know, a real decrease in bricks and mortar retail spending. But some people have done well. I mean, certain businesses haven't lost at all. If they had the right setup or the right, you know, retail establishment that just, you know, sold masks or, you know, did, you know, certain things, they, you know, they've done well during, even during the pandemic, but it's for those that, you know, the pandemic really confined kind of the thing that they were selling. So if you were in paint sales, you did great during the pandemic. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> home renovation, um, home renovation <laughs> all of that, but, but the, this is the number, yep, that we're seeing right now. Okay. Thank you. You bet. Okay. So let's move on to what owners and managers can do. Um, so, you know, what they're saying here is we're likely to see a shift in business models because of this pandemic. And because of the shift, they're kind of saying to small business owners, you know, should you be asking yourself if you need to change or adapt, you know, with all of this, you know, you know, I think you're kind of seeing from the last slide that, you know, if you're losing out on all this e-commerce business, your shift may be to e-commerce and that's what you're going to be, be doing. But they're also asking people, you know, to kind of, do I need to change or adapt what I'm selling? You know, do I need to change or adapt, you know, whom they sell to, you know, do I, am I not reaching the right audiences, which might be e-commerce, you know, I'm reaching a whole new group. Um, They're also asking, you know, how they create community with their customers. You know, if this is long-term, how do we create community with our customers? Um, How do they deliver products? You know, how will they deliver products in the future? And what makes them unique and why will customers return? after COVID. So they've got to be thinking those kinds of things. They, um, one of the publications I looked at said, focus on the customers or the consumers craving for experiential. So before, you know, we always love these experiences, but they're saying they're going to be craving it, you know, when we finally feel like we're safe enough to go, but make sure that safety is noted, that you don't lose the safety protocol as well. And I did read in a lot of places that 
this whole online buying was going to continue even after COVID was done. So uh, some of the things, again, you know, have you called your past customers? Have you reached out to them? Have you increased your social media posts to be sharing so much more on social media platforms than you ever did before? Are you delivering product that you might not have delivered before? Um, ha, you know, have you had staff involved in managing um, maybe a project that you're doing within the business when they were on a different job within the company? Have you kind of moved uh, staff members around? So let me take a look at a few more things. Uh, one of the things I came across was this framework called the heart framework. And it was just trying to, you know, ask yourselves as business owners and managers, you know, um, here are some areas that you may want to think about as you're, you're, you're working through this, this time of the COVID environment. You know, can you humanize uh, to your customers and let them know that you realize, you know, how dire the situation is and that you empathize, empathize with those that are affected by COVID-19 and really spell out the steps that you're taking to help your customers and employees and stakeholders. They, they want to know. They want to know your softer side, but they don't want you to overplay it. So you can, you know, you really need to humanize what you're doing and in your care and concern, but not overplay it. And that was mentioned quite a bit. Um, are you educating your customers about what you are doing, which I think we've talked about, you know, if you've had to reduce staff, if you've, you know, um, if your facilities had to close, you know, if your ordering options have changed, you know, consumers need to be educated. They also want to be assured um, that your company values will continue. You know, so you kind of start to get worried as a customer. You know, I know that they may be, you know, not making the kind of money they made before because of this pandemic. Does that mean, you know, how they're handling this or that is going to change? Are they cutting corners? You know, and so really assuring your, your customers, you know, that your values will continue as you operate and you move through this pandemic. And then they're, you know, they're also saying revolutionize what customers value about your business. And so I think I was telling you a little bit earlier, you know, what are some new ways that your customers would love to work with you, but you just, you know, haven't done it before, you know, so, so really revolutionize what your customers value about your business and kind of take it to new levels. And then again, you know, kind of ends with tackle the future, you know, establish a timeline for when you will reevaluate the changes that your company operations need to make. And so I think right now, business owners are getting really used to that because they've had to move so quickly um, through being open, being closed, doing curbside, doing outdoor dining, you know, all those kinds of things. And so it's really a difficult time, but the heart framework was one of those ways to kind of just try to show to the customer, you know, how much, um, how much you're doing and how much their support of you means. Any questions? I don't think we have any questions right now, but okay. I thought it was really great what you said about humanize. I know um, in coming December, we have a webinar that's all about crafting your brand. And I feel like now that's so important because, I mean, you're selling yourself. And I think that's right. such a a way to connect with new customers, especially since I know we can't get that in-person right. interaction right. that we normally did. Yeah. Um, one other thing that's kind of interesting to consider, I don't know if you've researched about this, but less people are using social media, especially considering tomorrow is um, right. election day. Right. So have you read about other other ways, I guess, or other social media avenues that aren't the traditional ones? Well, our, you know, I haven't done too much into other platforms other than, you know, YouTube um, is kind of the one that I, you know, I usually gravitate towards. You know, I've, I've done a lot on YouTube. Um, I follow a couple of speakers and they actually have learned to broadcast to several different ones all at the same time. So they are trying to cover the multitude of people who may be joining in and, you know, different, different facets. So I don't know which ones you might use um, that people on the call would be interested in. Or is, are there some that you're kind of gravitating towards at this time? Um, I actually had a really good conversation with uh, Laura Weisskopf Blyle this morning. Um, she is the co-founder of ShambanaMoms.com, which is a really important and 
relevant blog to our community and she had mentioned that instead of focusing on social media they are putting a lot of time and money into researching SEO so finding or, or learning ways in which they can drive more people to their website through just internet searches but also really focusing on that email newsletter yep. on how that is what people most gravitate to, to regarding purchasing items and getting information about your business. That is true. I think that what I've seen in a lot of people who have done that, they've coupled that with their social media posts. Um, so they've kind of merged them all together. You know, I follow a lot of, you know, healthy eating people and um, who are doing a lot of broadcasts right now. And certainly they, they all kind of structure what they're wanting to sell based on that email message that you said, but they're all kind of hopping on um, collaborative efforts and they're kind of co-promoting with different groups, which I think has been really effective. I've, I have this chef that I follow and she is doing three shows a day, um, bringing in speakers. And so everyone who's selling a book, selling a recipe book, uh, vitamin, you know, whatever they're doing, um, they're jumping on her show and then vice versa. She's jumping on their platforms. And so it's been, you know, kind of like in a way working with your competitors, um, but they're using it in a good way. And I think they're able to build their audiences off of each other. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Let's, let's move forward. Okay. So one of the areas I'm, I'm really passionate about right now is just, I think we're at a point in this pandemic where it's been it's been a lot of months and people are shocked how many months it's been from the beginning of the start and I can't believe we're in November today but you know the mental health of everyone from employees and business owners is, is a huge concern right now they you know people have been kind of enduring this for a long time and so I think it's it's really a, a good opportunity right now if you haven't you know, if you are in a position to where you're connected with employees or staff members to really spend some time you know, checking in. Uh, one way I, I feel like just basic, you know, just a very basic thing is we do a lot of Zoom meetings right now where we're not face to face. And a lot of times people are able, you know, like you guys have done today, turned your cameras off. And I, I, which I think is totally fine. But I think if we're wanting to check in with people, um, we need to schedule, you know, personal Zoom meetings where our cameras are on. So we get a good, good eye, you know, so we really physically look at each other and make sure that we're, we're seeing them and really hearing from them. And so uh, some of the information that I listed here was just some things that you know, managers and owners of companies can do. One thing, model healthy behavior. You know, are you getting those workouts in? Are you eating appropriately? Are you using this time and, and have kind of a goal in mind? Like, you know, if we're still in this for six months, what's a goal that I can set for myself to really, when I come out of this, realize that, you know, something beneficial did happen because of that. Um, so I think, you know, we really need to model that behavior. Um, business owners need to be vulnerable, you know, share with people what's going on with them if they, if they can, I hope they can, so that people feel safe in, in, in really sharing what they're going through because I think it's really difficult right now. Um, I was talking to a member of a hospital staff today and once we had kind of taken care of what I was there for, you know, I just said to her, you know, how are you doing? And she started crying. She said, this has been so stressful. And she's kind of a, not in the highest stress position in this particular office, but it's still very stressful. And she just said, you know, I can't tell you when someone comes in and doesn't have their mask on or, you know, it kind of goes below their nose or they cough, just the stress that we're all under. And so, um, really, you know, reaching out to your staff members, checking in, uh, building that culture of checking in with each other, having a meeting to do nothing of planning, just to check in with each other is being advised on a number of sites. Um, offering flexibility if there's a way to rotate staff within your company so that you can kind of give those with high stress positions, maybe some low stress opportunities to kind of move and move around so that they can kind of be pulled out of those, those areas. Um, communicate more than you think you need to. And I think that's really important. You know, a lot of times people will kind of say, you know, I really want to be flexible, but they never really say how they want to be flexible and they never really spell it out for people. And people still feel like, you know, can I really ask them for the day off? You know, I feel like they're tight. You know, what can I really do? And so I think communicating more than you think you need to is important. Um, if you can offer a training on mental health, 
do that, you know, get some training. Um, there's some information that I found on just, you know, the stress first aid care for yourself. Um, it was on a PTSD website. It was uh, va.gov. You could probably find it there, um, a little bit more information about that. But it, that was all about take care of yourself first, share with others what you're doing to take care of yourself and kind of model that behavior. But, you know, investing in some mental health training at this time, I think would be key. And I, uh, one of the things, the study that I came across, just so you realize how big the issue is, this Mindshare Partners conducted a global study of employees. And I think they had, I thought it was a million people in their study. I'm not sure. I thought it was a huge number. Um, let's see. They found in this study of all the people surveyed, which I thought was rather large, 42% of respondents um, had declined in their mental health since the outbreak. And this was in August. So, you know, people were really seeing their mental health decline. And this isn't just, you know, not, you know, mental health, you know, that people thought prior to, but everybody's feeling something mentally. And they're showing, you know, 42% of people responded that way. So it's really important. Um, and the last part, you know, modify policies and practices. There's so many ways to do this. Um, let's say before the pandemic, there were three things that you always had a staff member do. I need you to do X, Y, and Z. Well, things are pretty stressful now, and so things are changing. You know, can you adjust? You know, if, if they can do one and three and get it done, are you okay with, you know, passing over step two? Are there some things where you can back off a little bit so that staff members have some flexibility in what they're doing? So, I, you know, those are some of the things that were brought out on looking at the, the mental health of, you know, your office, your, your colleagues, and yourself. Any questions? I think we're good for now. Okay. But um, these are such good points. You bet. I can't, um, I know that at our work, we've had uh, my manager, she's been sending out just kind of uh, little things that we can start doing to invest in ourselves. Yep. And a lot of those include, um, here's just some personal growth training, like yep. that has been so beneficial for us. Yeah. Some of the ones they did um, that I thought were really helpful uh, through the university, and if you have a source to do this, it might be helpful, or, or maybe there's certainly ways to, to grab it off of YouTube and share it with your staff. But we had, you know, so many of us are sitting at a table looking at a computer, and so we had an opportunity to just do these lunch hour, they were probably 15, 20 minute head and neck exercises, like stretches, and um, a trained I guess physical therapist came on and actually gave the training and it was just a perfect 15 20 minute stretching opportunity to relieve some of the neck and and you know shoulder tension that a lot of us are feeling right now and I can't tell you how beneficial that was um, for those of us within our company that took advantage of it I think it was really positive and well received I know the classes always filled up I think they were pretty much unlimited um, they also you know provided some other kind of takeaway pro, you know, projects that you could do from home that were more fun oriented. There was a class on bird watching that was just like a 15 minute on your lunch hour bird watching class. And so we were partnering up and you know, you guys are in Champaign. So, you know, maybe there's a way to partner with some of those aspects of campus that could provide some resources like that as kind of just a little getaway from all the stress that's happening at this time. That so. would be so much fun. <laughs> I know great it, idea. It, it was it was wonderful and I, I think it really just kind of helped us you know um, relax a little bit uh, let's see if there was anything else I missed as I was looking there um, one thing they were you know also saying is you know really create that environment of open communication you know encourage staff members to reach out to others you know have these regular forums provide mechanisms for staff to express their concerns you know ask questions encourage peer support among your colleagues, you know, all those kind of things I think we, we do, but even more important during this time. Okay, uh, one thing I'll just draw attention to, and I know this is more of a, you know, customer service thing, but if you have, you know, if this is being watched by somebody with a lot of frontline staff who are dealing with those traditional customer service um, calls, what the research was showing, Harvard Business Review did an article back even this was even even in april of this year and they studied a million customer service calls um and they were showing that they have nearly the they were kind of categorizing the calls as you know 
how difficult are they? And so they said those that were categorized as really difficult calls for those answering them had doubled already in that time frame. And most of those calls were all about financial hardship. You know, I don't know if I can pay the bills or, you know, what's happening, I can't keep up with it. And so one thing I would share with your staff, if you can, is do you have a policy in place to deal with those customer service calls that come in that you know are coming? Um, do they have the procedures and policies ready to be able to answer those calls to provide you know, a yes to this is what I can do instead of this is what I can't do? It really helps that person within the company who's charged with answering those calls and gives them some you know, ability to, to feel like they're helping people that are really desperate for their help. Um, and I think if you kind of leave it up to, I'll just wait till the calls come in to handle them one by one, you as a business really need to take the time ahead of time to kind of plan out a strategy because, and I'm sure you've already done that already. I'm sure this has already happened, but it, as this continues and, you know, if, if positions and people losing their jobs and stuff continue, really focusing on how you're going to handle, particularly those difficult customer service calls is important. Okay. Let's, let's just move to some best practices. You know, um, you know, what are we seeing out there? I mean, if there was a lot of people on the call tonight, you know, I would love to kind of uh, gauge, you know, and I think this would be probably a good activity to do if you're ever with, you know, your competitors or with others to kind of just say, boy, I went here or I did this and this was the best customer service I received during this time. And it really, when I think about where I'm going to go shop again, you know, I went there because of this. And so I think uh, maybe for a lot of us, I don't know if those on the call, you know, have any suggestions like that. I've got a few, you know, sitting here in the next couple of slides, but I just wanted to open it up to those on the call that might want to discuss, you know, what are some of those areas where you've just, you know, you felt really good about what they were doing um, with customer service? It doesn't have to be safety related, but are there some areas that really um, impressed you or, you know, allowed you to kind of feel good about going back? While people get their thoughts together, I'll share. Um, I'll also start my video. Um, so Hopscotch, it's a local bakery in town. They have been from the get-go really, really great at ensuring individuals can access their items in a safe way. And it was wonderful. Um, I know for Mother's Day, I went and ordered some items online. When I went in in person, um, one of the owner, owners greeted me outside. They had people rushing cakes and stuff to and from, but she also she was, uh, mentioned, she's like, you've been here before when we were open. I was like, yes, I have been. And she, we had talked about what I had previously ordered, which was a canal. I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, but she had recommended a drink that she thinks I would like based off what I had previously purchased. Wow. And I got it wow. <laughs> because it was that, um, facial recognition, she remembered me. And, you know, yeah. she might not have, I highly doubt that, but it made me feel like she wanted me to be there. And she yeah. did, but it was very personal. And I think that is just the most important aspect for me yeah. um, in COVID and out of COVID. Yeah, I, that, that yeah. personal touch is just, um, you, there's nothing like it, you know, to really feel like, you know, your shopping there really means something to them personally. So, you know, I think that's, that's really important. Um, you know, best practices, you know, you know, a lot of them are, you know, are you doing the stuff um, that you need to do for, you know, this is the best practices for retail, food stores, restaurants, and food pickup that they follow kind of the guidelines that are here on the screen, you know. Um, those are the, the things that were, you know, be healthy, be clean, clean and disinfect, social distance, pick up and delivery. You know, all of those areas are, are avenues of where you can really be doing the, the right kinds of things. But, you know, those best practices of engaging the customer. I'm trying to think um, of some areas where I felt like, boy, they just did it all right. For me, a lot of it is just the touchless. Um, can I call you? Will you take my credit card number over the phone old school if you don't have, you know, way for me to, to use it online. 
uh, is everything packaged and sealed when I get there and I know exactly when it's ready. You know, those are the things for me are really, really important. I know also um, and in seeing people, you know, we're all behind a mask all the time, but you can really tell a lot from people's eyes. And I think, you know, seeing um, any, I guess in seeing staff members that are still calm dur during this um, makes me calm and I want to be around those people. Um, you know, anybody that kind of still has a smile behind that mask during this time, I want to be there. And uh, certainly I, I want those protocols followed, you know, that's certainly key. But, and I also, again, you know, Madeline, as you had said, you know, anybody who really remembers me or, you know, prior to and, and kind of remembers things that I've done, boy, that's always impressive as well. So any, any other comments? And then if anyone would like to talk, I'm very happy to <laughs> unmute you <laughs> also. Sounds, sounds great. I'm just going to move to kind of nearly our last slide. And I just, I'll throw it up on the screen here as we're kind of thinking about other best practices. What we're seeing, and this uh, you guys can kind of see on the screen where this information came from, 43% uh, of small businesses have started rethinking the way they do business since the, the coronavirus pandemic began. 32% uh, have found a new way of delivering existing services and 22% have asked employees to learn new skills to support changes in the business. So that those are just some of the things they're doing to survive. Um, as we kind of think about, you know, best practices leading, you know, going through all of this, um, let me give you just a few more to kind of close out. And if we have more comments, we can talk about them. So, you know, that whole online uh, is not going away and it, it's going to continue even after the pandemic. And so if you can do, you know, so much of what you want to do online with a business, we, we see the numbers and the numbers are increasing in that space. So best practices would be if you're not online yet, start, you know, doing some investigating and see are there any aspects of your business or things that you could be selling online that you're not at this time. For example, you know, if you're the hair care place that always relied on cuts, um, you know, maybe you're selling some of your products online or you're giving recommendations or, you know, different things. Um, if you, you know, if you could kind of get that online network set up, um, it's going to pay dividends even after the pandemic. Other things, um, the big box stores, you know, they are all about, you know, efficient pickup and fulfillment and, de and delivery, but they're not the ones doing the delivery. They're actually looking at third party people to do delivery. But if you're, you know, if you haven't started to do delivery as a small mom and pop, um, really look to that. What some of them are doing is, you know, the staff members who they might have had to let go, they're asking, you know, would you stay and be interested in delivery? And that kind of is kind of keeping that connection with your customers with someone they knew from the store. And we're seeing that that was kind of beneficial. Um, other areas. Now, these are the ones that I thought were probably the most innovative that I saw um, out there. They were saying establish and be prepared to keep your safety standards long term, but then they said innovate the in-store experiences. So one of the things they pointed to were instead of the way your stores were normally set up, they were kind of turning them more into showrooms of like what could be. So, you know, if you can't go and try on a bunch of clothes or, you know, if that's not the issue, you want to see them more, um, you know, maybe you've got more mannequins, maybe you show more displays, maybe you put more product out to kind of show what different showrooms would look like. They also said some of the biggest things that they think will happen in the future is hyper-personalized service. So any way you can hyper-personalize service to somebody, which means call them, reach out to them, provide an opportunity to shop by appointment. Wouldn't that be nice if you felt like, hey, I'm not gonna have the whole place open to anybody that wants to walk in. We're doing shop by appointment now and we're kind of in individualizing our experience. And then a lot of them are also pointing to online uh, consultations. I would love, you know, to see, you know, I haven't shopped for clothes in a long time. You know, if there was a local shop doing an online, you know, um, runway or online, you know, display of their products, you know, we're seeing some of that out there with different stores. I love the live touch, you know, where they're not just um, pictures, but I love hearing them. Video is really important to me, at least, sh you know, short snippets of video really means a lot as well. 
Um, those are some of the things that we're, we're seeing with, you know, just some innovation of, you know, how to deal with what's happening and then how to kind of create something now to deal with the pandemic that's going to be with us afterwards. And so with that, um, I can you know, take any other questions. I can also, you know, remind you that, um, again, my name is Jennifer Russell and I work for the University of Illinois Extension Service. I serve an area that's in southern, you know, west central Illinois. I serve about six counties, but I also can do programs all over the state, certainly because we're offering Zoom at this time. So encourage you, if you've not worked with uh, University of Illinois Extension in the past, you know, consider, you know, looking us up, finding out, you know, who represents Extension in your part of the, you know, if, if people are just from the Champaign area, look and see who represents them and, and reach out to us for any other program needs that you might have. With that, I'll see if there's anything else. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer. Uh, I'm going to allow people to type if they have any questions or feel free to raise their hand if they'd like to verbally ask any questions while I um, provide some kind of reference here. All right, just showcasing a last slide or not the last, but just going over some information that I had said earlier. Again, the library is open. We're back to our regular hours. If you have any questions about this webinar, webinar or other services um, involving business, feel free to contact me. I'm Madeline Wolski, the business librarian, and you can get a hold of me or any of my other colleagues at via email librarian at champagne.org. We're also available through chat during our open hours and via phone. If you want to do a book a librarian, which again is a one-on-one -on -one consultation with any of our librarians and experts, just fill out the form at champagne.org slash book a librarian. Um, it doesn't look like we have any chats yet. I'm going to keep on going, tell you about our next presentation, which is um, in two weeks. So it's next Monday at 7 p.m. I'm going to be talking about how to utilize our business databases and library resources to target your ideal customer. So a little bit of market research one-on-one. -on -one. And I hope you'll join me. You'll just need to register online, champagne.org slash events. All right. Well, it looks like no other questions are needed. That means that uh, you went over everything, Jennifer. So fantastic oh, job. <laughs> and Thanks for having me. I absolutely. It. Thank you again for coming into the library, sharing your ex expertise and all of these great resources. Jennifer also shared with me an amazing um, just list of resources that you would use to put this presentation together. So I'm more than happy to forward that on to any interested parties or individuals. Thank you, Madeline. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. All right. Well, everyone have a pleasant evening and we wish you a good night.